So thank you very much, Pastor Tommy, for that introduction. And it gives me a great pleasure and an honor to uh, speak in this setting, but um, I, I do feel a great sense of responsibility to speak in this setting. I understand that this, is the, uh, this pulpit is the core of our church's uh, teachings and our activities. And I've taught, uh, as Pastor Tommy said, I've been teaching for about 20 years in Sunday school, but it's, it really is a different thing to be here. Um, I speak before judges as a lawyer, but uh, to know that I'm speaking before the judge of the universe and that I'm accountable to him for everything that I teach, it's a, it's a different kind of uh, responsibility. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm also one of the instructors for the upcoming uh, well, we have started the, the new Equip and Entrust program. Uh, Brother Keon led us in our first session yesterday, and it was about the gospel. And a few months later, I'll be speaking on the Christian worldview. So I thought I would take this time today to uh, whet your appetite a little bit on this concept of worldviews. And to give a bit of an introduction, I'll be describing, uh, just touching the surface of what worldviews are. And we'll be looking at the book of Romans and uh, chapter 1, 18 to 32. I think it gives us an introduction into this whole concept of worldviews. So what is a worldview? Well, it's made up of two words, world and view. Right? So you can guess that it, it's talking about the way you view the world. It's how you view the world. And when we talk about the world, it's not just the physical parts of the world, like scenery, the earth, but it's basically all of life and reality. And so some of the questions that arise in looking at worldviews is, what exists? Right? Is there a spiritual world outside of this physical world? Is there, does God exist? And part of this question of what exists is how did things get here? Because whether you believe in the spiritual and God would determine uh, your view on how things got here and where are things going? Okay, so that's all part of this question. Next, what do we rely on in terms of figuring out uh, what is true and wrong? Uh, what is the basis of your knowledge? Do we rely on revelation, uh, God speaking to us, or do we rely on our reason, our senses? Uh, that's part of the worldview analysis. And what should we do? We call this ethics, right, or morality. What should we do? What is the right way to live? And what's the basis of judging those things? So these are all uh, questions that arise in worldview. In philosophy, we call the first one metaphysics the second one, epistemology, and the third one, ethics. And it's so important to look at worldviews because your worldview will influence your world do. And world do is not a real word, I just made it up, but it, uh, it rhymes with worldview and it does convey the message that it's what you do in the world, right? So, it's so important to look at worldviews because it influences your world view. As I said, we'll look at uh, Romans chapter 1, 18 to 32, but uh, just to give a bit of a background on the book of Romans, uh, Pastor Tommy has been taking us through the, the great adventures of the Apostle Paul, and he visited and encouraged a lot of churches around the Mediterranean Sea. And he wrote a book, a letter, in fact, to the church in Rome. And the book of Romans, even as a brother Keon has uh, made his point yesterday, it's one of the, the you know, best articulation of the gospel message in the Bible. And the gospel is the good news of salvation, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and the salvation uh, we have through that. And the book of Romans uh, articulates this message of the gospel, but again, as Brother Keon would have us know, to appreciate the good news, we need to know the bad news. And that is why you would expect that at the beginning of Romans, chapter one, Paul begins with the bad news. Right? 
Before I get into uh, applying this uh, passage for us, the basic message of today's passage is that God is holy, he is just, and all of us stand guilty before him. And not just the Jews, the Israelites who received God's revelation, the, the Ten Commandments and other laws, but also the entire world. We call them Gentiles. Most of us are Gentiles here, I believe. Uh, we are non-Jews. We are, uh, the Bible might refer to us as pagans, uh, Gentiles. And the main message of Romans 1 is that there was a time when Gentiles, way back, we knew God. Maybe not perfectly as we, as we do now, but we knew God, and yet we descended, regressed into idolatry, idol worship. And that's the message of Romans 1. And because of that, we're not excused from uh, ignorance of sin. And Romans, uh, I'll, I'll just call this Romans 1 for short. Uh, Romans 1 refers to this progression of humanity from worshiping God to worshiping idols. And I'm going to suggest to you that there are three ways to apply this. The first one is the historical application. This is more like an interpretation of the passage, but there are some applicational parts when you apply it to other uh, ancient civilizations. So this is the historical application. I'll explain more of this as we go on, but this is what Romans 1 uh, meant to the original readers and the audience. Right? Paul is describing of the world from ancient times up until his day. That's the historical application. Next we have the contemporary application. Contemporary means for us today, we can see some insights and patterns in Romans 1 that are applicable to us today as a society. So that's the contemporary application. And lastly, I'll go through uh, uh, very briefly the personal application. The first two, one, two, refer to the progression of societies from believing in God to uh, idol worship. And you can apply this uh, on a personal, individual level as well. Right? What's true of society is societies are made up of in individuals, so we can apply this to us as individuals. That's the personal application. And, and I'll go over all of these in detail. And every time I go through these applications, I hope that you can gain a, uh, another insight into the same passage that I'll be going through. So by looking at number one, you can understand uh, Paul's times and the New Testament times. And by looking at number two, hopefully we can understand our times better. And by looking at number three, personal application, hopefully we can understand ourselves better in our, our faith walk and sometimes, unfortunately, um, falling away from God. So to begin, number one, historical application. Romans 1 explains how human society went from worshiping God to worshiping idols up until Paul's time, first century. So Paul's time is the, the time of the New Testament. Um, around his time, uh, you know, Pastor Tommy took us to Paul going to Athens and seeing all the idols. And I'm going to go through uh, each verse. First with this uh, historical application. So let us all turn to Romans 1, 18.32. I have the scripture up there with some alternate translations in the brackets, but it's always helpful to compare with your Bible. So let us dive right in. Romans 1, 18-32. Paul begins, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So Paul begins with reminding his readers that God is holy and just, and he is angry at sin. And the thing about this verse is that, you know, the fact that God is just and holy and he's angry at sin can be gathered from other parts of the Bible. But what's really unique about this verse is the last part. It says that those who are uh, unrighteous are holding or suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. The point here is that not only are we sinners, but we are deliberate sinners, right? Sin is not just an innocent mistake, but sin 
It's something that we do out of our rebellion, uh, out of the depravity in our hearts. And it's not that we're just making mistakes when we sin. We are actually suppressing truth. And that's the point that Paul is making, and he goes on. Because that which may be known of God is manifest or evident in them, for God has showed it unto them. So Paul is speaking to his first century believers, uh, these pagans, and Paul is saying that God has made himself clear, even to you, pagans, Gentiles. And this is where the Gentiles, the pagans, would object, saying, you know, Paul, we understand that you're an Israelite and God has revealed to the Israelites, his law, but God never revealed himself to us, right? We were just scattered around the world and we had no idea who God is. So that might be their objection. So because of this, Paul starts his argument in the next verse, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead or divine nature so that they are without excuse. Paul is saying, hey, that's not an excuse that you're not an Israelite, you don't have the the books of Moses. God has revealed himself to you. How is that exactly? Well, Paul gives us uh, two examples, that through creation, through the things that are made, we can infer God's eternal power and Godhead, or divine nature. So we'll look at these two. First of all, there's the eternal power of God that we can infer from his creation. When we look at the world, we see you know, the moon and the sun, the oceans, the mountains. You know, we can't help but to think that you know, something must have started this. In contemporary terms, we refer to this as the cosmological argument or the argument that there is a prime mover, the the first thing that started all of this, or the uncaused cause. It's basically the the view that something, you know, at this point we don't know if it's a person or a thing, something had to make all of this. Whatever it is, it must be powerful and existed before all of this. So it must be eternal. Eternal power means something that's not temporal, something of this world, but something beyond, above us. And a lot of people in our society uh, hold to this kind of thinking, but they stop right here, where they think of God, conceive of God as some kind of a force, right, or a disinterested first mover of the universe. That's why Paul doesn't stop here with eternal power, but he also gets to his second example of what we can infer from creation, it's God's Godhead or divine nature. Right in the Bible, when we see divine nature or Godhead, we often uh, are thinking about the Trinity, God, the Son, Holy Spirit. And Paul is not really saying that you, you can infer the Trinity and all there is to know about God from creation. Right? We need the, the written word for getting that far. But we can get some glimpses of God's personality. That God is a person. He's not just an impersonal force. Whatever created all of this likes beauty, order, care, relationships. You look at the world, and despite the fallenness of the world, we do see glimpses of beauty. Uh, Even animals tenderly taking care of their young. There is order to all of this and relationships, right? We can infer that, you know, this isn't just some kind of uh, impersonal force that's just bluntly making things, but there is some kind of a a personal being behind all of this. This creator is not an impersonal force, but is personal and relatable. And beyond this, you can't really, you know, get to God being a trinity, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but But Paul is saying this is enough for all of you pagans, Gentiles, to acknowledge that there is a creator. So you are without excuse if you don't believe in him. And Paul continues, verse 21. 
because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations or thinking or speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. There's a lot to unpack right here. There's a chain of events. Uh, Paul is saying that people are not excused because they knew God. There was a time when humanity at one point gathered together knew God. And this is a controversial statement because if you've taken courses in history of religions or religious studies, uh, they would have taught you that this belief in one God, monotheism, came about with uh, Abraham, and Abraham being the father of Judaism, Christianity, and uh, the Muslims uh, trace their faith to him as well. And you would have been taught that the whole world originally started with uh, pantheism, polytheism, worship of many gods, worship of nature. But Paul is saying, no, people once knew God. It is controversial, but when you do look at ancient religions, a lot of them do have traces of an original belief in a creator. Uh, you know, in the Chinese religious tradition, today we know the uh, you know, Chinese spirituality is uh, containing aspects of ancestor worship, superstitions, Buddhism. But if you look at their ancient religious beliefs, they do have a belief in uh, what they call the Shangdi, the ancient, uh, the belief in a heavenly emperor, the Most High. And over time, the beliefs about him have become corrupt, but, but I think that is a trace of the ancient Chinese people originally when they, they migrated from the Middle East. They, they kept this belief in a creator. The Hindus of India as well, Today, they have thousands of gods, right? a god for each activity. But they do have a belief in the Brahma, the creator god. And it's interesting how, apparently, when you look at their religious writings through the ages, uh, they start paying less and less attention to uh, the Brahma, their concept of the creator, in exchange for uh, the more uh, practical deities. And also, we have in Canada, the First Nations people and their spirituality. A lot of times in schools, they, they teach us about uh, animal-based deities, right, nature, but they too have the notion of the Great Spirit. It seems that they too, in their distant past, they carried this idea with them that there is the Great Spirit that, that made all of us. As Christians, we, we acknowledge God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right, so they do have that trace as well. So when Paul says they knew God, I, I take that literally. There was a time when humanity all gathered together, knew God. But what happened? They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. People started paying attention to practical needs, their daily lives, what they needed. They needed to win wars. They needed to uh, you know, have fruitful kids and have a great yields during harvest. So they started uh, going after other gods who were hopefully more specialized in their field. It's kind of like how we go to uh, a general practitioner doctor, a family doctor, and we feel that the doctor doesn't know what he or she is doing. We might think that it's better to go to a specialist. These ancient people, uh, they apparently thought of the creator as perhaps too distant or not interested enough in their everyday affairs, so they started making specialist gods, right? The god of fertility, god of agriculture, god of war. And it's through their vain imaginations or thinking or speculations that they, they came about. It, it, you know, there is a certain logic to it. Right? The creator of the universe, maybe he's too busy. He's got a lot on his hands. Maybe we need to go to more specialist gods. It's corrupt, wrong thinking, but, but this is what happened. They became vain in their imaginations, and they conceived of all these gods. And the result of this, their foolish heart was darkened. Darkness in the heart, in the Bible, refers to spiritual darkness, being cut off from a relationship with God, 
even being cut off from uh, the knowledge of God. So the more people got steeped into idolatry, their heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. In ancient cultures, religious teachers and priests, they were esteemed by their societies. They were esteemed as wise men. But according to Paul, all of this is nonsense. Right? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. This is all nonsense. They're, they're fools because they left the knowledge of the true God. Paul continues... And these people exchanged or exchanged or transformed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Here Paul is talking about people exchanging the knowledge of the creator God for idols, objects made by human hands. And sometimes they look like humans, sometimes they look at like birds or other animals. And I highlighted the word changed or exchanged or transformed because Paul begins to develop this theme of changing or exchanging. And here Paul is using this word to show that people changed the glory of God. They exchanged the glory of God for these lesser things. Well, they're not even lesser, they're just nothing. They're vanities. So Paul starts to use this word. So pay attention to the word changed. Wherefore, or therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed, there it is again, or exchanged or transformed, the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Here Paul is saying that, the people in their sin were so insistent on sinning that God just gave them up to their sin. It's like a child who really wants something and, and the parent knows that it's not good for the child, but the child, the child is so insistent that the parent says, okay, go for it. If you get hurt, if you get a tummy ache, uh, you bear the consequence. So we have God doing this. And again, verse 25, Paul says, these people changed or exchanged or transformed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. In the previous verse, it was the glory of God being exchanged, but here it is the truth of God. A bit of a parallel structure here, talking about a slightly different aspect. But again, Paul is building up this theme of changing. People are changing God, their perception of God. Verse 26, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change or exchange or transform the natural use or function into that which is against nature. This verse will be difficult to understand unless we go to the next verse. Uh, this is setting up uh, for the next verse. But two things need to be mentioned here. First is this reversal. Remember, up till now, Paul mentioned change or exchange twice in reference to how people are changing their perception of God. But here, it is people, specifically women, who are changing their natural use or function. And this goes to the second point, where it says the natural use or function. Uh, it appears to appear in the more literal translations some translations say natural relations for unnatural relations, and that, that gets the message across. But the point here is that people are changing the functions of their bodies. They change God, they change their function. So as I said, uh, we'll have a better understanding of this passage when we go to the next verse. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use or function of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense or penalty of their error which was due. So we know what's going on here. People are changing the natural use of their bodies, being overcome by 
by lust and putting the pursuit of pleasure above the design purpose of their bodies. And the last part of this verse talks about the consequences of that, receiving in themselves the, the penalty of their error. Whether it's, you know, we don't know if Paul is talking about health consequences or societal consequences, but uh, there are consequences to changing the natural functions of their bodies. And to summarize this point up to this, the point that Paul is making is that when you change God, you change man. You can't literally change God, right? God is immutable, he can't be changed, but people can change their, their perception of God. And when you do that, you change the perception of man. You transform God's nature and you end up transforming man's nature. You lose the designer, you lose the design. This past week, I guess Apple, the company Apple, uh, held their, their conference and they revealed the new iPhone 900 or whatever it is now. Right? Uh, Back in the day, I remember it was more exciting for the world. Uh, things are a bit lackluster now on you know, designing smartphones. But back then, when Steve Jobs was at the helm, he would announce that he's coming up with a new product, and people would flock to the auditorium, and he would show his new product like you know, it's his baby, right? Him and his engineer team have been working on it for many months. And people would insistently listen to what this new design is what it's supposed to be used for. But imagine that you're a bunch of monkeys descending from the mountains and you come into the auditorium and, and you snatch one of them phones, and you take them back to your forest. As a monkey, you have no idea what that amazing product is supposed to be used for. You might start banging it, chewing it, or like cutting bananas with it. It, it might be a very good banana cutter, but that misses the whole point of the design. And that's what it's like to not hear from the designer. You have no idea what the design is supposed to be used for. And you start misusing, abusing it. This is all to say that when you change the way you view the world, you change what you do in the world. You change your world view, you change your world do. So that's a bit of a mid-passage summary. Paul continues, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to a depraved mind, to do those things which are not convenient or appropriate. So the people are searing their conscience. Right? God has given us a conscience to you know, know that we're in the wrong when we are, but when people are so steeped in their sins and their heart is driving their mind, they can sear their conscience, they can suppress it as with a hot iron. And that's what people are doing. And God is, again, giving them over to a depraved mind. And what happens when our mind becomes depraved? Well, it's like a dam breaking, right? That dam has so far held this chaotic reservoir of water. But when that dam breaks, what happens? Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Time wouldn't permit me to go through each of these uh, sins here, but for our purposes today, just take it as a, a long list of sins and all that is wrong with the world. When that dam breaks, that dam of morality breaks, depravity, sin, lawlessness abounds. Today we call this moral relativism, but the Bible calls this lawlessness. And lastly, Paul concludes this section saying, 
who, these people, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So there is definitely judgment for sin. God is holy, and he needs to judge sin. Paul is also making the point that these people should know that judgment awaits for all that they do. So that is the interpretation, uh, slight application. We looked at some ancient cultures. That's the applicational part of the historical application. And this helps us to understand Paul's context, the context of the, the New Testament. And after chapter 1, Paul goes into the, the gospel. Right? He's setting up the bad news here, that we really don't have an excuse for, for being guilty under God. Now, the three ways to apply Romans 1, I'll now go to the contemporary application. Romans 1 has accurately predicted our Western society's move from a God-conscious society to a godless society. So let me explain a little bit. When I say that Romans 1 has accurately predicted, I'm not saying that Romans 1 is a, a prophecy about the future. Romans 1 is about history up until Paul's time. So I'm not saying it's a prophecy, but the insights about human nature and the patterns of civilizations, these are so universal that they can be generalized to other times and places. And so my, my suggestion for you is that when you read Romans 1, and you can see some parallels with how our Western society fell from a place where we were more God conscious up until today's godless society. I think this can help us understand uh, Romans 1 as well as understand our society better. And that might be a little small, but I'll go through each of these sections with their own slides. But we can extrapolate some stages in the pattern of civilization falling from god worship to idol worship. Stages towards a godless society. We start with a belief in God. Right? And second step, God's glory is neglected. Step three, reason is trusted. Step four, heart is darkened. Step five, God is replaced with something else. Step six, design is denied. Step seven, pleasure seeking takes over. Step eight, God is erased from the public consciousness. Step nine, moral fabric unravels. Step 10, judgment. And perhaps depending on societies and what they value, some societies might value reason more than others. So some of these steps might uh, be different for societies. But for our Western society, I do think there is a very close parallel to uh, this ancient society that Paul is talking about. So we'll go through each of these steps. First, we start with a belief in God. Well, at least our Western society did. Verse 20 again. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead or divine nature. Verse 21, Paul says they knew God. And just like Paul's society, our Western society started with a belief in God. And starting with the third century BC, here we get to some of the more contemporary philosophical issues and summarizing the, the history of Western philosophy. Uh, the Western world is built largely on Greek philosophy. And if you know Greek philosophy, you can be even more specific to mentioning people like Plato and Plotinus. They basically believe that the physical world is just a glimpse of the ideal world. So we live in this physical world, but these philosophers said, hey, there must be a more ideal world out there, whether you call it the spiritual world or whatever. And this isn't really the way all of the world thought at the time. And this kind of Greek thinking a really uh, paved the way for Christianity to be accepted by the society. Of course, we believe that the gospel has power to save and people who come to salvation do so through the power of the gospel. But as a society on a philosophical level, Western society uh, 
Christianity did really well in Western society because of this metaphysical, uh, this view of reality that was established by the Greek philosophy. And what the Christian theologians early on did from Augustine all the way up to Thomas Aquinas, they articulated the gospel message uh, in a way that was consistent with this Greek philosophy. Basically, the gospel will deliver you from this physical world to the ideal world. And working with Greek philosophy wasn't always perfect. Sometimes there were heresies that emphasized too much of the ideal world and saying matter was evil. Right? That definitely happened. But, but as a starting point, this Greek view of the world, that there's an ideal world and our physical material world, it, it's, it gave a little bit of a, a wedge for Christianity to enter. And because of this, Western society was largely God conscious. They didn't always do the right things, but at least in the backs of their minds, they, they knew that God existed. But then something happened. God's glory is neglected, Paul says, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Do you know which era or time period in our Western history that people started focusing away from God? focusing more on man and what man can do? It's the uh, 15th, 16th centuries uh, Renaissance period. The Renaissance was a time of rebirth, rediscovering the classics. And what happened during the Renaissance period was there was a gradual focus away from religious subject matters. You might know some of these people, uh, Donatello, uh, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, the Ninja Turtle artists, right? Uh, they painted themes, sometimes with religious themes. They would say that it's a religious piece of art. But at the end of the day, gradual focus was, uh, focus was gradually shifting to glorifying man. Right, focus on the human body and human subject matters. A great example of this is Michelangelo's uh, David, if you know what I'm talking about. This statue of this finely proportioned man. And the only way that you can tell it's David is that if you look hard enough, he's holding a sling. Right? But other than that, what is it? It's just a sculpture glorifying the human form. So there is a veneer of religiosity, but but ultimately, focus is shifting to glorifying the human body and human subject matters. So what happens when you start thinking as a society that, that humans are great, humans are the pinnacle of reality? Well, you start relying more on human abilities. So we get to the third step. Reason is trusted, but became vain in their imaginations or thinking or speculations. I believe the ESV says thoughts. They became vain in their thoughts. So when is the period of time when people started to put so much emphasis on their thoughts, their rationality? After the Renaissance came, the 17th century, early enlightenment period. Enlightened means to uh, become wiser, smarter. At least that's what the people thought that they were applying their, their reason to solving life's problems. This is when people thought human reason and human perception, senses, are to be trusted. And for a while, there was a, a feud between these two camps. Uh, one camp saying reason is to be trusted, Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. And there was another camp, people like Hume, saying that perception is supposed to be relied on, and there was this conflict between the two, but ultimately, what is it? It's reliance on the human brain. And this is where society headed. That people are trusting their brains above all things. And after this, stage four, heart is, har heart is darkened. Paul says, and their foolish heart was darkened. What came after the early enlightenment? Well the later Enlightenment period. The early Enlightenment philosophers, a lot of them are still Christians and they believed in God, but 
in every generation, even in our day, right, people just keep pushing the envelope more and more from their previous generation. And what initially started as a, you know, a pretty interesting inquiry about the limits of human reason, what happened in the later Enlightenment period was they just started thinking more and more about how the brain worked and what we can actually perceive. And with philosophers like Immanuel Kant, we get this idea that we can never truly know reality because our brains are hardwired to process reason and perception only a certain way. We can never access true reality. The name of the philosopher who started this kind of thinking, Immanuel Kant, is really ironic because Immanuel means God with us, right? But starting with his philosophy, he couldn't tell if God is with us because you can't perceive whatever that's outside of our senses and our, the way our brains are hardwired. So I don't know if you fully appreciate or understand what's uh, being thought of during this century, but, but maybe that's the point, right? Because here we're all interject saying that philosophy can mess you up. We have this precaution from Colossians 2.8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. The more you focus on human philosophy and reason, thinking about the, the limits of perception and reason and all of this, it just messes with your mind. There is no way out if you don't rely on revelation. And you can get locked up in this prison of your own subjectivity, of your own phenomenological lived experiences. And that's what happened to her society. They didn't heed this precaution in Colossians 2.8. In the next stage, God is replaced with something else and changed or exchanged or transformed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Here we get to the late modern period, 19th century. And the idea was this, if God is not real or knowable, then we need new morals. Up until now, Western society was accepting Christian values, Christian morals, but they said, hey, if, if there is no Christian God, why are we following Christian values and Christian morals? We need a new set of morals. And this is where we start seeing the new ethicists. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche, he says, if God is dead, he's dead to us, then we need a new set of morals. And what should we do as human society? Well, basically, his philosophy is be the best version of yourself. And others like Schopenhauer, he says, you know, this life is depressing. There's no way out of our subjectivity. But let's just enjoy life through meaningful art. Beautiful art can transcend you out of this dreary existence. The interesting thing about this is that this is from the 19th century, it's two centuries ago, but when you talk to a lot of your friends and neighbors who might not believe in God and Jesus, and you ask them, how do you find meaning in life? They will say stuff like this. Well, my meaning in life is to be the best version of myself and to instill these values to my kids. Or, you know, maybe there's no ultimate meaning, but I enjoy my art, my sports, whatever. So these ideas right, are so influential in our society and these these philosophers from the 19th century they're still ruling from the grave and I'll also add that this is why for a lot of us today things like dramas anime movies they're so compelling to us right because what what is anime or drama well they're forms of art that take us out from their from our mundane existence and be the best version of yourself. Usually the protagonist, the main character, is out there to be the best version of him or herself, like become the pirate king or whatever, right? So all of this, this kind of thinking is still with us today. And ultimately, man becomes God. We're replacing God with man. And then, stage six, design is denied. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections for even their women to change or exchange the natural use or function into that which is against nature. Early 20th century existentialism. 
They say that humans are not born with predetermined definitions or identities. We define ourselves. For us to have predetermined identities or definitions, we need a definer outside of us. But if you don't believe that, then who determines what humans are, what our identities are? Well, according to the existentialists, it's just them. We come into this world without any predetermined essence, but it's our existence, it's what we do that define ourselves. That's this kind of thinking. And during this time, there was a, an influential existentialist feminist philosopher, Simone de Beauvoir. She said, a woman is not born into this world, but becomes a woman. And when you hear a quote like that, it, it seems like something that we uh, heard from a, you know, a gender theorist from the past 10 years, but this is an 80-year-old quote. And to her credit, she was talking more about the, you know, the chauvinistic aspects of society, and she wasn't really as, as uh, drastic as today's theorists. But these ideas have been cooking for a long time. And then we get to the pleasure-seeking stage. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use or function of the woman burned in their lust one towards another. So there are many aspects of us, right? God has given us the ability to appreciate pleasure, but we also have design. We also have his, his will to perform. But we see humanity placing pleasure-seeking at the, the most important place in our existence. And in mid-20th century with materialism, Humans just have physical needs and wants, and we will be happy if only we receive our pleasures. So everything's a commodity. Even people become commodities. And some of you have lived through this period from the beginning, um, mid-20th century. And there was that feud between two economic systems, capitalism and communism. And we can agree that under a free society, there's more religious freedoms, but ultimately, what, what is that conflict all about? It's about which system can meet the most human needs and wants. So unless you have a faith, a, a faith in Jesus and this capitalist system, it, it really is the same. It's, it's operating on the materialistic view of the world and human needs. And that's what we get in the 20th century. Step eight, God is erased from the public consciousness. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not appropriate. So society becomes allergic to notions of God, mentions of God, customs, symbols, traditions, ideas that point to God are removed from society. But when I was a kid at preschool, we brought peanut snacks, and uh, some of the kids may have been allergic. So over the years, we stopped bringing peanuts to uh, school, and I think that's good for a health reason, right? But, but when it comes to notions of God, people are allergic to God, just like peanut allergic people are allergic to peanuts. They can't even have a trace of God in our customs or symbols. And we're constantly taking more and more of these mentions of God from society suppressing our conscience. Number nine, stage nine, moral fabric unravels. And I won't read through this long list again, but remember it's the long list of sins breaking forth out of this dam. Society's moral fabric unravels. In late 20th century, 21st century, we come to the postmodern age. Postmodernism, sometimes we reduce it to just people wanting to be relativistic, people just wanting to do what's right. There's actually a philosophical foundation to postmodernism. They believe that morals are tools used by the powerful oppressors in society to maintain their positions of power. So when the postmoderns came, they actually had a, a valid critique for some of the oppressive regimes like communism and, and Nazism. But what's really insidious about extreme postmodernism is that they apply this thinking to just about every place where there is some kind of authority. So it includes the Bible, the church. They think that these rules and commands we have in church or the Bible are there to keep the powerful in power. So their mission in society is to 
deconstruct and dismantle these oppressive morals. So they're not just about people gathering and say, hey, let's just do what we want. There's, there's a, they think they're fighting a mission. They think they're fighting the good fight. That's why it's such a strong force. And then lastly, there is judgment. And I don't know if we're there as a society. Uh, hopefully we are not. Well, that's the contemporary application. Now, I'm not going to go through uh, at length too much about the personal application. It's basically taking what's true of societies, whether it's the society up until Paul's day or Western society up to now. It's taking these insights and patterns that apply to societies to us as individuals personally. So you just have to rephrase the steps a little bit, stages towards a godless life. You believe in God. Maybe you came to church as a child and you had a notion of God. Or maybe there was a time in distant past when you first believe in God, but, but you fell away from him. Number two, you stop giving glory to God. You start paying more attention to things like entertainment, other things other than God. Stage three, you trust your reason. Your heart is darkened. You feel so dark in your heart. You, you can't even feel that God is with you. You replace God with something else, some other morals, some other thing to depend on. You deny your identity is made by God. And when we talk about denying your identity, it doesn't have to be as drastic as you know, denying your gender or anything like that, but it can be something like denying that God has a will for your life. You start to make decisions on just what you think is good for yourself. Seven, you become addicted to pleasure. Right? When God is taken away, when your definition, your design is taken away, re really all that remains is pleasure and seeking pleasure. And when you're so addicted and you can't break this cycle, you might get so sick of God's voice and you get to step eight, God is erased from your consciousness. You know, maybe you were still going to church, but you know, you're so sick of feeling guilty that you just cut off this part of your life, this voice that is speaking to you. And you momentarily sense a, feel a sense of peace, right? but it's a false security. In step nine, your sense of morality unravels. Just anything goes. Whatever that was stopping you is no longer there. And then there's judgment. And it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to go through judgment, and that's what the gospel is for. We're still in Romans 1. Right? So this is a, a lot of downer information. I'm a lawyer, so I specialize in giving bad news. If you would like the good news, Please speak to Pastor Tommy, attend Equip and Entrust with Brother Keon. That's what the good news is all about, is to save us from all of this. And Romans 1 is a roadmap of how we got here. Where did we make the mistakes as societies, as human, like, as individuals? And the great thing about a roadmap and knowing where we made the mistake is that, that we know where to go back to. And Romans 1 shows us why worldview matters. You change your God, you change your worldview, and you change what you do, your attitudes and behaviors. I think Romans 1 really shows that pattern, whether it's during Paul's day or, or contemporary society or even your own life. When you change your God, you change your worldview, you change what you do. We need to get back to a God-centered worldview. And if you would like to go more in depth about this, I really encourage you to start coming to Equip and Trust, where we're dealing with the gospel message, but we'll eventually deal with other subject matters, including the Christian worldview. Ultimately, we need to get back to God. And again, that's through the gospel. So I know I keep mentioning this, but come up to Equip and Trust. Let us understand you know, the way that God has made for us to get back to him. We need to get back to him as a society and as individuals. Uh, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that, that you are a good God. You have revealed yourself to us. And we have left you as a society and as individuals. We pray that we would be wise, not be those people professing to be wise, but
They're truly wise, according to you. That we see ourselves as, as unable to fix ourselves. And it's only by your, your unmerited grace, your, your salvation that you give us, that we can come back to you. Please whet our appetites through the bad news that we know that we need to take corrective action. And please continue to bless our church. Thank you, Lord, for all the, the willing souls coming out to learn from you on Sundays and on Saturdays. Thank you that you're building us up, not just in numbers, but, but in faith. We entrust this church in your hands. And ultimately, Lord, we pray that you're glorified. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.